Hello everybody and welcome to the Royal Astronomical Society. We're here today for the Meanwhile Back on Earth event in conversation with Oliver Jeffers in partnership with the Royal Astronomical Society, CLPE and HarperCollins Children's Books. My name's Dr. Sheila Kanani. I'm the Education Outreach and Diversity Officer at the RAS. I'm also a planetary science and author and a teacher. I absolutely love Meanwhile Back on Earth and also here we are. Um, here we are particularly because of the messages of kindness, but the space references as well. And being a teacher, particularly of GCSE astronomy, I'm really excited to be here today because this, is, this event is for teachers. So without further ado, we will start the questions. So you've just been around the UK promoting your new sculpture, Our Place in Space. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came to place? It's basically the coming together of about five or six different things. Um, uh, I've always been interested in uh, how we know what we know as people. Um, and I remember reading Bill Bryson's book, A Brief History of Almost yeah. Everything. And, uh, you know, just like how heavy is the earth and who worked that out. And, you know, it's like my reading that I do, I tend to read nonfiction because there's so much interesting things, so many interesting things that have actually happened. It almost seems like a waste of precious time yep. to read about things that are completely made up, even though I completely make things up half the time. <laughs> but uh, in that, he says that there's, you know, the, the maps that we have of solar systems in classrooms are wildly inaccurate because you can't really have a scale map of the solar system just given the amount of space yeah. and everything. Um, and I thought, that's so fascinating. Could you do it as a, as a sculpture? And um, I thought about this for a long time. I talked to various people along the way. It's like, well, where could this be done? How could it be done? And um, something really clicked whenever uh, this, my brother and, and a few other people from Northern Ireland had heard about this, this uh, uh, open submission for commissions from Unboxed, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of the Unboxed Festival, and just giving real money to real art projects that weren't, uh, you know, just the extension of something else. So yep. a lot of times money in public art is uh, as an extension of a development, but this is the first time I'd ever seen real proper money that was actually for art. And so as um, a group from Northern Ireland, we were thinking, well, what can we talk about? Um, and I'd, at the back of my mind, I've been playing about with this idea of, could you do a, a scale model of the solar system? And um, Professor Stephen Smart was in that group and we were talking about that. And then the idea of how to link it to Northern Ireland, suddenly the penny dropped. I was like, yeah, you know what this is? I've been explaining Northern Irish politics to people in New York for a long time, and it, it really uh, kind of dumbfounded me a little bit just how little they knew or cared, and that, that sense of perspective from a problem to, totally changed how I thought about it. Mm -hmm. And could we apply that to this skill model of the solar system? So we came up with an idea of it not being a scientific model, but being an art project about yeah. how you feel about the way in which we divide ourselves when viewed from a distance. So it's a 591 million to one scale. Uh, so what, uh, the Earth is two and a half, or sorry, the sun is two and a half meters in diameter and uh, Earth is about that size. It's about 500 meters away. Yeah. And, you know, all sorts of really fascinating things came out of that, like, uh, you know, trying to find rel uh, relatable comparisons. Yeah. So it takes, how long does it take uh, light to get to the Earth from the sun? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. You can walk on the trail from the sun to earth in four minutes, which means that you're traveling at twice the speed of light. Yeah, I so like stuff like that. things like that. Mm. But um, yeah, the the I went to Tennessee to see a total eclipse of the sun once, you know, oh, the path nice. of totality. And mm -hmm. it's like it's a big difference from that seeing it when it's 100% eclipsed to even 99%. Yeah. Because you don't see the moon until it's like 100% percent eclipsed and suddenly there's this big black hole in the sky and <laughs> you, you know as a, somebody who's you, if you can walk you can navigate a room you're spatially aware and you understand distance that you feel um and all of a sudden when i was looking at the black hole in the sky i was like wait a minute that's i'm looking at two objects with a massive amount of distance between yeah. them and i suddenly felt it i was like how do i communicate that yeah um but then you know the if earth is this size and mars is uh, what, like a third of that size and it's it's a uh, hundred and something meters, you wouldn't be able to see it, especially yeah. unless you're in a total vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, but I came up with another idea then 
uh, having spent some time in Vegas with uh, 10,000 librarians, actually, for the <laughs> American Librarian Association. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's how you get somebody's attention is with neon letters and arrows. So built these arches with the name of the planet and a big giant arrow. So you yeah. can kind of work out where it is and you, you get that feeling. Mm. And so that's that's how I came to be. And Brilliant. yeah, it's the, the, the idea being that it's how you feel about Earth and it all relates back to Earth. Yeah. And looking at ourselves and how we, as I say, how we divide um, from a distance. Definitely. We do some scale models, you know, when we go into mm -hmm. schools and things and we use fruit and veg and toilet rolls and, but you can't, it's hard to do scale and size yeah, all in one go. It so really is. That yeah. covers both things. So it, it, you know, you need eight and a half kilometers, 8.9 kilometers to, to get to Pluto. Um, and you need it in a relatively straight line um, just for the for the, the feeling to work. Because even though yeah. how often the planet's actually yeah, neatly in a straight line. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and it's, it's and if it were being closer to reality, it might be that you start at the sun, then you walk to Earth, but Mars might be on the other side of the sun. And maybe not even on the same plane. Yeah. It's like it's, it's, exactly, what is, yeah. it's everything sort of being dragged around behind the sun like a, uh, like a DNA or something. <laughs> Yeah. So what's your favorite sculptural planet in that trail? Uh, well, I think that my favorite sculpture in that trail is actually the big us, them, earth that we, that we call it. And we still haven't managed to get it quite right because it's so complicated. But it's uh, every, uh, every border is, is there, is sort of raised up as like a wall almost. And inside every country, there's two sets of lights, uh, a red light that says them and a blue light that says us. Mm -hmm. And the idea being that they alternate and you can okay. look at any conflict at any point in history from either perspective by that simple metric. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like, and then it changes. And you're like, oh, wait a minute, you know, whose side am I on? What is, uh, is, is there an us under them? Um, that, I think that one really, really works, uh, but it works best at sort of sunrise or dusk because of, of the lights, um, or maybe in winter, um, or, or the sun, because it, it was just a lot of fun to make it look like a sun, you know, yeah. like, like one of my drawings. Yeah, brilliant, cool. So the exhibition launched in Derry and then Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good place to take children and it's free for the public. Yeah. And it's going to Liverpool next? Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know when this is airing, but it uh, uh, opens in Liverpool on the 15th of October for probably four or five weeks, I think. And then it'll end up back in Northern Ireland. So teachers can take their children, yeah. their school children to... Brilliant. Yeah. And then Meanwhile Back on Earth was inspired by the trail. It was. It, it completely was because, uh, you know, working with... Um, tech designers and engineers and astrophysicists, um, I think I, I, one of my biggest roles in it was, um, aside from like the, the inception of it, but was like reminding people, like, this is not a scientific model, although it is, that's not the, the end point of it. This, yeah. is, this is an art project and the art project, any art project is you, you want to try and uh, communicate a way you want to you want to you want to help people feel a certain way so yeah. how do we get people to feel a certain way about this and when you start at the sun and you get to earth you're thinking about earth but once you leave earth and you're heading out further out into the solar system my kept thinking kept being like how do we get people to look back at earth yeah and and also in just finding these like relative ways to uh, talk about that that the, just the pure distance that we're traveling yeah and the speed um, actually, it was uh, I had this idea when I was uh, with my son on our way to his, my father-in-law, his grandfather used to be a race car driver. Okay. So we were on our way to, to see the track that he used to race on and, and Harlan was saying, he was like, I'm going to drive in a million miles an hour. I was like, no, <laughs> you're probably not. <laughs> um, but uh, I was thinking, you know, like, do you feel like we're going fast now? And, and he said, yeah. And I was like, this is 40 miles an hour. Um, <laughs> And then I suddenly thought, wait a minute, the, you know, kids would know what 40 miles an hour feels like. Yeah. Adults know what 40 miles an hour yeah. feels like. How, what time would it take to get to between get. the planets in reality at that speed? Yeah. And so um, Professor Stephen Smart and I then, I got him to come around to the studio and we sat and worked it out. And he was able to do all the calculations in his head, which just beyond Crikey. me. <laughs> um, but it very conveniently, at 40 miles an hour, it would take you 11,000 years to drive to Pluto, which is sort of the birth of civilization. Yeah. So I was like, what do you do with that information? And I was like, right, this is a way that we can use the time it takes to drive between the planets as a measuring stick to mm -hmm. look back, back in time. In time. Yeah. And uh, because the whole thing was about us, them, and these, these ideas of division and how we fight each other over space and these imaginary lines in the sand, um, 
using that, uh, it, you, you could throw a dart back through history and wherever it lands, you're going to find some all-consuming battle over mm. territories or Is that border just some disputes. Sad, co sad coincidence, sort of thing. No, it's it's a it's a sad uh, consistency. Right. It's not yeah. a coincidence. It's like we have just always, 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 always fought each other over space until about eleven thousand years ago, when we were too busy trying to just survive the elements to bother yeah. with fighting each other. Yeah. And that's kind of where we are now. Need to be. Yeah. And uh, it's so that yeah. You know, whenever I was starting the book, the war in Ukraine was just breaking out. And I was okay. like, do do we include this or not? And it was almost like too late too, but we thought about it. And then I thought, no, I'm not going to because this is the, actually the first time, you know, the, the historians call since World War II, the long peace. Because it's actually the most peaceful period of human history. It just right. feels like it's a lot more turbulent and angry because we have access to information immediately uh, from everywhere. Uh, and, and and I don't think humans are designed to compute that much information coming at us from every angle. Mm -hmm. So it feels very turbulent, very broken, but we're actually, it's just because we're more aware of yeah. everything. So it's the most peaceful period of human history. And uh, I wanted to sort of make that point. It was like, really for the first time in 11,000 years, we need to work together to survive the elements yeah. rather than just distracting ourselves with fighting with each other. wars between humans, yeah. So the the correlation between the world conflict and the, the planets and the you know looking mm -hmm. back in time, did did the distances come first or did did you pick the conflicts or uh, no? The, the, it had to be accurate. Yeah. So um, basically, it was like all right, eleven thousand years. That's that's a, that's a pretty nice. You could go whatever speed. You know, if we'd gone a bit faster, but just because that's the speed I happened to be driving yeah. at that point with my son, it was like wow, this this really works. It's actually thirty seven miles. An yeah, hour. but. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I think Stephen found out that it was slightly more like fitting if we just reduced it and that you know it's kind of the average speed that yeah. people drive at yeah. so it was like a very understandable metric um, mm -hmm. but then at that point it was yeah you can like pick a date 400 years ago what battles were going on yeah hmm. there were so many it was the the difficult thing was actually choosing which ones to to do that That's would sad, be that and mm -hmm. here here was the way that that I decided to include them or not was are they visually identifiable without either naming the place or the people uh, or the conflict itself and so you'll notice that you know like the 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 American War of Independence mm -hmm. for example it just says some people after crossing an ocean yeah. and fighting the people who are already there decided to start fighting each other that's yeah. all you really need to say about that yeah it's like imagine explaining any of these conflicts to an alien you know it's like how ridiculous they saw it yeah and that's sort of the way I felt whenever I was explaining for example I'm a patron of integrated education in Northern Ireland and when I got the letter through my studio in Brooklyn my intern was a young African-American woman from Atlanta mm -hmm. and she's like integrated education what what does that mean and I was like it means two groups of white Christians go to school with each other, even though they diff believe, believe in slightly different versions of the same religion. I was like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And when I started pointing that out to people back at home, like, yeah, I suppose when you put it like that. And it's like, so a big part of it is almost trying to explain the ridiculousness of these, these conflicts with enough perspective to somebody who really doesn't know anything about them. Yeah, and teaching the next generation that we've yeah. got to work together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So with time travel in mind, if you could time travel, where would you go and why? Or when would you go and why? Uh, uh, I, th I think I'd go about 50 years into the future. Okay. Just to see how similar it was? I <laughs> guess, because, well, almost to just sort of test my own theories. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I, I, I'm an optimist, but I think that things are actually getting radically better. Okay, Even the good. way everybody else thinks that it's all going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. I think things are getting radically better. And, uh, and I have a feeling about why. And I, I'd be just very interested to see. Okay. Okay. Is that anything to do with children? No. I mean, <laughs> I mean everything's to do with children. It's yeah. like children are, are future adults. Yeah. But what I, what I think is that uh, we are, uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've been really at the, the, the sort of the, the dregs of the barrel of the breakdown of community and society, which sort of happened systematically uh, at the end of World War II. You know, uh, whenever, I suppose, the USA became very uh, influential, very yeah. wealthy, very quickly, and, you know, no ill intent. Uh, I think advertisers all over the world figured out that you make a better customer if you're in competition with your neighbor. Yeah. So keeping up with the Joneses. And it was just that slow eradication of a sense of community. And it was all about you as an individual. And, you know, like look at today, um, 
the job of trying to be a mother with a job is almost impossible, yet everybody sort of feels it's like expected. That it's yeah. expected. Yeah. And, you know, that like it takes a village to raise a child is true. Yeah. And it's this, I think we're starting to recognize that, that that's why we feel so unsettled. Mm. And we're starting to reforge those, the, the, the bonds of community. Yeah, which is so important. Yeah. So important. And, and uh, you know, why, why things feel so turbulent and, and wrong is because we're actually talking about them for the first time. Yeah. You know, if you think about any of the big issues that we're facing at the minute and then picture them 50 years ago, they were way worse back then. Yeah. But we just weren't even talking about yeah, them. Definitely. So the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. Mm. And we're no longer indifferent. Which is good. Good. Yeah. So the the book is a story about a father and his children journeying through space. Yeah. But as you read it, you begin to realize that Earth is very much at the focal point of yeah. the book. Was that always the point? It was the, exactly the point, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it was what Galileo figured out that Earth is not the center of the universe. Yeah. But it actually is. For us, it is, yeah. Well, because, you know, for, yeah. for what other life is there? What other consciousness is there? This is the only place where stories exist or anything makes sense. Definitely. Um, yeah. And I, uh, I I got Stephen Smart a zinger with this one because I, I asked him, I was like, what's what's the one point in all the constellations that's the same? And he goes, there isn't one. I was like, yeah, there is. Earth. <laughs> Those patterns don't make sense from anywhere else in the universe. Exactly, yeah. We, we are the center of yeah. our universe. Yep, definitely. Although, yeah, well, so that's a whole other. <laughs> well, question, no, it depends it? on <laughs> it depends on how you define centers. Like, is yeah. it is it movement or is it meaning? No, exactly. Because if it's meaning, yeah. this is the center. Then, but if it's movement, then definitely not. So yeah. Who knows where the center of the universe is? <laughs> yeah, and again, from the center of the universe is from our point of view. So yeah. even in geography. Exactly. Um, so, how would you suggest that primary teachers can use this book? I think this book you can use it to to talk about. Uh, well, space and time, um, and just how much space there is in space. It, I think it's a good way to to show, like the you know the the rough geography of our near uh, yeah. near galaxy, yeah. um, and the movement of planets. But I think it's also uh, a, its most useful. I think point is is looking back through human history, mm -hmm. and just the 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 conflicts of of territories. I I stuck pretty exclusively with. Um, uh, issues or battles that were about uh, land or, the, yeah. or, or, or space or charity. I stayed away from uh, religious yeah. uh, ideologies, things like that, because that gets into a lot more. That's like you know mental territory, uh, yeah. and that that's yeah. it's just that's it's cleaner this yeah, way. Yeah, you can get to pick one yeah. one type of battle. Yeah, definitely. and you know, looking at kids fighting in the backseat of a car, you're like, yeah, that's, yeah. that's <laughs> is this is this what Putin's doing right now? I mean, uh, it's, uh, and then the lines like my daughter actually said, don't look out my window. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, the, the this this is a pretty funny comparison for the way in which people interact with each other. Kids are right. <laughs> so did you always have a fascination with space when you were a child? I or? did, yeah. I think um, I, I got to go to summer camp when I was in upstate New York, uh, when I was a kid and uh, when I was about 11. And the Belfast is known for light pollution. I mean, you know, British mm -hmm. Army put in a lot of street lights so they could see things <laughs> at night. So you don't really see a lot of stars there. Um, but uh, in upstate New York, very rural. And I remember uh, at night, um, there was, we're all, there was like a, they were doing a, music on the grass and we're looking up at the stars and you could just see everything and the milky way was there and somebody pointed out that you know the the galaxies are flat like a like a dinner plate yeah. like a frisbee and when you see the milky way we're actually we're at the outside of the plate looking into the middle mm -hmm. and it was just like suddenly i got a sense of this massive like overview and yeah. Uh, yeah. ever since then i've been pretty fascinated with brilliant that's what I liked yeah. here. <laughs> what about the artistry and the illustrations? Um, did that come from teachers kind of recognizing your talent or was that? Oh, in general? Yeah. Uh, oh, no, I, I think it was more because I figured out that I could use it to get out of doing other things. <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, I, Yeah, my, my mom and dad were always very encouraging in art. Um, they never really, you know, they never, there's my book, uh, Once Upon an Alphabet, I think it, the dedication is my dad, it's to my dad and is like, thanks for never making us get a real job. Uh, That's but the, <laughs> the, the school that I went to, I think because I was interested in anything, it was not very academically inclined. Um, the, I think they, I was encouraged because I showed an interest at all. But really it was, um, I, I recognized that there was, uh, there was transactional value in it way back then. Like I could get out of doing geography by doing the set of the school play or, or I could 
uh, appease the, the school bully by, you know, John on a skateboard. But then I sort of realized that I actually really enjoy this. And yeah. I, I enjoy the connection that it has with how other people feel. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, we love the science and art collision. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of space art projects around and yeah. um, obviously yours as well. Um, so what advice would you now give to the, the child, Oliver? To um, the child me? Yeah. I, um, I think I would encourage me to... Uh, I, I got it pretty early, but, uh, you know, to say it even earlier, it was like to just stop caring what other people think. Yeah. You know, so especially in art, you just have to, you've got to do it because you want to do it. Um, and I think that the, you know, that, that sort of self-awareness, just you, you second guess. Mm. And uh, what was it, the old Robbie Burns thing is like, uh, if you're worried about what other people think about you, you'd be surprised to realize how little they do. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, you gotta, gotta, you gotta be at peace with yourself. I yeah, think. you do you. Yeah. Yeah, that well, the youth is wasted on the young, though. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so, well, I got to meet Agnes Varda once, and she oh. said something brilliant, which is, uh, there's only one age, alive. Okay, I that's, like that. that's pretty neat. Yeah. <laughs> um, so your debut children's book, How to Catch a Star, was first published by HarperCollins in 2004, and it's gone on to sell millions of copies worldwide as well, 12 million. Um, so was writing and illustrating for children always part of the plan? No, not at all. Okay. Um, I've, I fell into it because uh, I'd always consider myself an artist first and mm -hmm. uh, the, the paintings I was making, the compositions were sort of one part of a story. There was momentum there. There was some kind of a, a narrative. Um, and How to Catch a Star came about actually from um, – recognizing the potential of one of those compositions that there was there was more to it than that and then drawing it out from rather than three or four individual images that were like an exhibition there's like put this in a book and then that forced me to think about like the beginning the middle and the end of a story and 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 really sort of finesse it and mm -hmm. uh i massively enjoyed that process and realized like oh yeah books are a pretty perfect platform for visual storytelling yeah and i've definitely. just been kind of relishing in that ever since mm -hmm. And with that in mind, how do you make quite sophisticated and complex ideas accessible to children? I think that's I that's probably the, the most enjoyable and the hardest part of what I do. Yeah. Um, it's how do I how can I communicate how I'm feeling in as in a way with as few obstacles as possible, uh, and that's just sort of testing and trying. And and you got I think I have to be able to understand what it is that I'm feeling to yeah. to be able to convey it. Um, but I was I was saying yesterday that. Uh, I used to think I, you know, say I was an artist, and then I would say I'm a bookmaker or a storyteller. But when I was um, doing this public sculpture for COP26 in Glasgow, uh, and it was this uh, rotating globe of the Earth where mm -hmm. it just said people live here in all the countries over and over again, and the idea being that it was like as the world leaders walk past it, hopefully to just sort of knock that arrogance out of them a little bit to yeah. you know think that these the uh, weather doesn't care about passports. Yeah, um, and they didn't have a box for artist in uh, for for my badge and they called me an observer and a translator mm -hmm. and i think it was like that's actually a really good description of what yeah. i do i think so i observe and then i try to translate i like that that's really <laughs> but i cool. just i try to make it as simple as possible and i think if you if you keep asking the why behind the why behind mm -hmm. the why you can really get to something where uh, and i have a feeling that no matter who you are, where you're from, or what you believe, I think all people fundamentally just want the same things. I've never met anybody who actually wants to be an asshole. I think people are just misunderstood, or their stories get misunderstood, and then they feel attacked, and they defend themselves, and yeah. it goes pear-shaped. But when you really get down to it, I think people always kind of want the same things. And if you can get to there, to that deep place, in a very simple way, I think that's when you can really move the needle. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So why do you think illustration is so important in connecting with children? Well, I think we learn to be visually literate before we learn to be actually literate. I think you, from before you can speak, you can read a face, mm -hmm. um, you can read a room. And uh, the I think that that uh, art and storytelling are probably some of the most, the, the, some of the most important things that human beings have ever created. Mm -hmm. And I get into this argument with some scientists at the, uh, uh, at COP26, but it was like, I think art is more important than science. And they're like, oh, really? And I was like, well, yes, because science is the how you do something, but mm. art is why, why? you mm. do it. Yeah, definitely. I like both. <laughs> oh, they're both absolutely essential, but it, it always annoyed me yeah. that 
it was STEM education and the yeah, STEAM was an afterthought. STEAM. Yeah. Whereas the A is the most important letter in there. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. and one of them actually, the, the, one of the scientists, like, give me an example. And it was one of those rare occasions where I could actually think of something off the top of my head. It's like, okay. I was working on a, a series of uh, paintings that were called Measuring Land and Sea and uh, showing, pa painting seascapes and then measuring the depth of, of the oceans. And uh, I work with a friend who went to that same summer camp who's now like a big brain marine biologist in the USA. And he was helping me with the maps. And he says, did you know that actually planet Earth is only the fifth best mapped object in our solar system after the moon, Mercury, Mars, and Venus? Good simply work. because we uh, have uh, spent more money and technology on mapping those planets okay. than bothering looking into our own oceans. Mm. And why is that? Because when the money and the technology were sort of being forced into that, it was the space race with Russia. So it was a story that defined where the science went. Yeah, it's all storytelling. It's all storytelling. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's nice that we hopefully can recognize that. Yeah. You know, during the pandemic when we couldn't do certain things. We could look up. We could yeah. still tell stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those were you know, for anybody things. who undermines the art, when they look back at the pandemic, what were you doing? You were watching films. You were reading books. You were listening to music. Yeah. You know, it's like those are some of the most important things. Definitely, lots of we did lots of coloring in in my yeah. house. <laughs> so you've exhibited in museums and galleries across the globe, including the National Portrait Gallery, the Irish Museum of Modern Art, the Palais Osberg in Vienna, and the Bryce Wolkowitz Gallery in New York. Can you tell us about any exhibitions that we should look out for? Uh, well, those are all sort of one-off exhibitions. They, you know, they they come together for a bit and then they they disperse. Um, uh, but there's a um, there's actually an exhibition that's going to be happening. I don't know if it's going to come here though. But uh, when I was making the the art for there's a ghost in this house. Mm -hmm. um, it's again. I sort of connected the bookmaking and the and the art making, and and so it was similar with that perspective shifting. Uh, I the the ghost book came about really because I was just playing about with I, I enjoy painting ghosts into empty rooms. It's just funny. It's kind of funny. And then if you do it in a sheet of tracing paper, you can move it around. And I thought that's a great premise for a book. But uh, when I was doing a, the experimentation for the book, I ended up painting a lot of ghosts into a lot of empty rooms, and they were all just sort of sitting there waiting there quietly. And then when I was looking at them all in a room, I was like, "There's there's something really sort of tragically poignant about this." Yeah. And then. You know, and uh, actually, Bill Bryson again in that book at home is the first line is like, uh, uh, basically, um, you know, the history books are filled with people who live fabulous lives and die gloriously, but most of us live fairly mundane, monotonous lives. And then I was looking at these, going, yeah, and then, and then why is it that people are fascinated with ghosts? Is because the you know the terror and the fascination in equal measure, and if every culture has had some version of a ghost, but if there is an afterlife awaiting us. Well, who's to say it's not going to be ex an extension of the way we live our actual lives? So painting all these ghosts waiting for something to happen just seemed <laughs> really sad, you oh. know, like looking for keys or waiting for the phone to ring. And it's like, if that's the an eternity yeah. that awaits us, it was like, would it change the way we live our actual lives? Mm -hmm. So that there's a, the, an exhibition, like a mini one that happened in New York uh, two years ago, and I'm working towards a much bigger one um, in a museum in Massachusetts uh, next not well, next year, the year after maybe. Um, that that's going to be like a continuation of okay, that. Okay, cool. There'll be some uh, World Book Day costumes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we are going to move on to some questions from teachers and students. Now. Okay. So this question is from Year Five <laughs> at Blue Gate Fields Junior School. Do you believe books can change the world? 100%. <laughs> Easy answer on yeah. that one. <laughs> yeah, totally agree. Um, two questions from Maria and the Year 6 group at Oakfield Prep. Um, first one, what do you think is the most fascinating thing about space? Earth. <laughs> it's got all the good food. Definitely. <laughs> well, yeah. What's your favourite thing? Um, well, no, I think one of the most fascinating <laughs> things about space is I just went to uh, the Brian Cox lecture. I consider myself fairly intelligent human being and I followed him for a while <laughs> and then he started getting into dark holes and I was like nope yeah. nope fabric for space time. no yeah no. I know I'm the same um, it's just like the you know he says when you get inside a black hole time and space reverse roles I was like hang on a minute let me think about that yeah. and uh, it's uh I, I think that you know the 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 more we know, the more we don't know. Definitely, it's like there's just this the the notion of the vastness of it all. Yeah, that's why I like planetary science because it's very tangible. Mm. Stay stay in the solar system. <laughs> so if you could live on another planet, 
whether that's in our solar system or not, which one would it be and why? I, well, I don't or think I would want to, <laughs> but I, you know, I actually did think I would like to go to the moon. Yeah. I'd like to have a, a holiday house in the moon. <laughs> but uh, I'd be pretty lonely up there. I really like other people. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but it, to, be, to be able to see Earth hanging like a Christmas ornament, as one of the Apollo 8 astronauts put it, yeah. I think would be pretty special. Yeah, I'd like to see Saturn, but I wouldn't yeah. like to live there. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, the last question from a school, um, it's from Sarah at St. Andrew's C of E in Enfield. What three things would you take with you on a journey into space and why? Uh... Brian Cox, <laughs> um, a lot of food, I think. Um, uh, I take my family, can that count as one? Okay, so my family count as one. Uh, you know, if we're going to sort of imagine there's a, a fridge full of really good food and um, music. Yeah, okay. Classical music. Oh, okay. Brilliant. Well, I do. Yeah, that's quite a nice way um, to end, I think. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So the uh, the teachers that sent questions in are going to get a... Well, by the way, I'm assuming we're not going to get cold or anything like that. No, and, yeah, yeah. And, we're, you know. we're assuming... Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you've got like a CD player and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or whatever people yeah. use these days. Like pick up Saturn radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, so the, the, the teachers that have asked questions are going to get a signed copy of your book for their school. Brilliant. So congratulations to, to those, those teachers and those schools. I um, just want to say thank you for, for coming today. Thank you to CLPE and the RAS and HarperCollins. Um, meanwhile, Back on Earth is out now. Um, buy it, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.